It's engine assembly time for the small block Chev. Everything's cleaned up, we've got all the bits we need. So what are we waiting for? Let's get this thing back together. First thing we need to do is to get the cam bearings back in. We've got our cam bearing installer tool. The cam bearings just fit over that collar and sit on the edge so I can just bump them back in. Small block Chev, so they're numbered. They're in order, so put it on the box so I know which cam bearing goes in which journal. The reason we pull the cam bearings out other than being worn out is the massive amount of sludge and varnish inside the oil galleries. So on the back side of this is a groove all the way around, which allows the oil to circulate the back of the cam bearing and come out the holes in the cam bearing to lubricate the camshaft and then go through and lubricate the main. So it's really important that we pull the cam bearings out to clean them up. Now it's all clean, we're putting it together. So let's get these cam bearings back in. Doing the cam bearings is a little bit fiddly, but I need to drop the cam bearing down in the orientation I want it with the oil galleys pointing in the direction I want. Feed the cam bearing installer tool through the back of the engine here. So I've got the, the back cam plugs out obviously, and all the, um, this is the first cam bearing to go back in. I'll do the first three and then I'll come in from the other side. So that way the, the cam bearing tool is as aligned as it can be so the bearings go in straight. Just get the cam bearing onto the, onto the installation tool and get it lined up. Just put a bit of weight on it. And then with my trusty hammer, hopefully just bump it into place. Obviously I want to get the cam bearing centre in the journal. So even if I've got to pull it out and just, just double check to see where I'm at, just got to, got to go a little bit deeper. Just that way the galleries line up. I'm lining up with the groove and, uh, and getting the galleries and the bearing in the right place. I reckon that's about it there. Looks pretty good, so I'll do the next one, and then the next one, I keep working my way out, then turn the tool around, do the rear one, and then come back in. That's it, last can bearings in. I'll take a chance now to blow air through the oil galleries. If there's any swarf that's come off of the, as those can bearings have gone in, I wanna clean it out now. So I'll blow all the oil galleries out, Make sure it's spotless. Cam bearing well supply can go in next. Next thing to go in is the rear well plug for the camshaft. Just a standard looking well plug. I use a socket to put it in. That way I can hit it right out on the corner. If you hit them in the middle, you will deform it and it will leak. So all I'm going to do is put a little bit of uh, retaining compound on that, a bit of sealer. And then we should be right just to, just to bump that into place. Try not to get too much on there because if you do, it will make its way into the camshaft bearing and it will cause you all sorts of trouble. Smear that around a little bit. Make sure I haven't got any, uh, any gaps in my sealant because last thing we want at this stage is an oil leak. Slip that in there, get my socket, put that on. Simple as that. Now that that's done and sorted, we can get it back on the engine trolley, which is a much nicer height to work on, and we can rotate the engine around. We know it's clean, we've blown it out. The next thing to go in is the camshaft. The only reason I put the camshaft in at this point is so I can reach down there and help guide it in. The lobes on the cams are really sharp. So if you're not pretty precise when you put this in and you drag all of those over the cam bearings, you'll wreck those bearings really fast. So now's the time to do it. I can reach down, I can guide the back of the cam in as I go. I've got a little tool that I put in the end of the cam to help me lever it up to get it in that last little bit. But that's it, just, just you know, be careful. Before this goes in, 
we need to put some assembly lube on it and then we're good to go. And that's it with the assembly lube on. Try to get it over all the surfaces, all the bearing surfaces, cam lobe surfaces. And that way everything's protected on initial startup. Just be really careful, don't bounce it around on the, on the camshaft bearings as you put it in. Sounds really easy to get it in there in one go, but it's uh, still quite fiddly. And just the patience and persistence. And it's a good time to, to, to get a feel for how it's going together. Make sure there's no high spots on those cam bearings. Make sure everything's free and sort of, sort of feels right. If you have to force the cam in at any stage, there's something's wrong. Pull it out and try again. That's all going in pretty sweet. Just get this last little bit. That's it. No resistance at all. Nice and smooth. So I'm pretty happy with that. Cam's in. That's the uh, probably the hardest bit of it. We'll keep moving. The next part to go into the engine is the crankshaft. But before we put that in, we're just going to double check our bearing clearances. Main bearings on these, two types. One's got a groove and a hole in it. And the other one's just a plain bearing. A couple of reasons for that, and it might seem pretty simple. One with a hole in it lines up with a hole in the block. This is where the oil comes through and feeds the main bearing. The majority of the load on this engine, on the main bearings, is on the caps. So they give you a plain bearing on the caps to better handle the load. Larger surface area, more wearing surface, and it runs cooler. So make sure you've got those in the right order. When they go in, just make sure the, the back side of the bearing is clean, the journal's clean. Line the tabs up, and they should just roll in. You shouldn't need to force them, you, sh you know, if, uh, and they should sit down flush. They should be quite firm in there, like they're not going to fall out but they, um, they certainly shouldn't take too much effort to get in there. So just line the tabs up and just roll it in there. Make sure the surfaces are clean. That's cap number one. It's got an arrow on it so I know which way it goes. They're tab to tab generally. The tabs are on the same side just in case. You can't find your mark or you want to double check that. We'll just tighten this cap down. We took the time when we cleaned the engine up to clean the threads up. So that makes it a lot nicer to put together. Let's get that sitting down nice and flush. Just put a little bit of torque on that. That way it's pulled into the right shape. And it's essentially we're measuring how the engine would be running. We're just going to use a snap gauge stay just to see the inside size of that bearing. So I'm, I'm pretty close to my adjustment. And these will ge generally won't be round. So check it in a couple of different directions and kind of get the average of it. These are elongated just by the smallest amount. But that's, I'm pretty happy with that. So I've just locked that up there. So I can now measure that with a micrometer. It's in inches because I'm old, that's how it is. So come up just, just to take the weight. It's a, it's definitely a feel thing. So I know where that is. And just straight over to the crankshaft. And same thing, just put a little bit of weight on it. Just so we know where it's where it's uh, where it's taken up, and it's kind of the same feel on the snap gauge. So that is about. I'll just double check that. That's about two and a half thou main bearing clearance, which, for what we're doing, is perfect. We should have good oil control and good oil pressure. Pull this cap back off. I can lay all the bearings in. We'll assembly lube it up and then we'll get that crankshaft in. All the bearings are in the block, just make sure they're sitting nice and flush. No dust, no dust on the back side of the bearings. No dust has fallen in the assembly lube and the mating surface for the main caps. There's no dust or debris on these. So we're right to put this crankshaft in. 
They are big and heavy and awkward, but try to lower it in as straight and as evenly as you possibly can. So it will be a bit tight on the truss bearings down the end, but that's it, that sat in there nice. I'll now put all the caps on and we'll start to torque this thing down. They're all torqued down to factory specs and just double check that the crank's nice and smooth when it rotates, there's no, there's no hard spots. That feels pretty good I think. Next thing we'll do, we'll get the, the timing cover on now, we've got the rotating, rotating assembly together. We'll do, the, we'll do the timing chain and get the front cover on. This is a timing chain assembly that was originally on the engine and it's in pretty good condition so we're going to reuse it. Simple as lining the dots up. So we've got the crank pulley already on the already on the engine. It's located by a key. So if I now try to do this, looking around the corner, if I can get the dots to line up, nothing about there. I'm where I need to be now. I'll just have to turn that cam just a little bit just to get the holes to line up. Just a little screwdriver in there just to spin it around. That's it. Before I tighten these bolts up, I will put Loctite on them, uh, only because I have seen them fall out. You can buy really cool retaining plates with tabs that you bend over for the bolts. Not what we need for this engine, but a little bit of Loctite's cheap insurance. These bolts only torque up to about 18 foot pounds, so not, not real tight at all. So the, the Loctite, like I said, it's cheap insurance. I have seen them come out. You can buy really cool retaining plates with tabs on them that you can bend over the bolts. But I'll find Loctites for something like this is, is heaps. Another thing you'll notice in there is the white nylon bush. It's for the cam retainer. When we originally got this engine, it had no cam retainer. It should have had something like that. That will no longer work with the flat tapper cam we've got in there. So we've just gone to the standard nylon um, bush. I've already done the mass, shorten that up to where it should be and that should hopefully work with the, with the aluminium cover we've got. So we've, we've upgraded from that, that tin rusty cover it had on it and it's now got a nice billet aluminium cover. We do need a little bit of camshaft end float. We don't want to don't push the cam up hard against the back of the engine. So very important to, to double check that and it's quite easy to do. If you leave the gasket out, you can measure the distance between the cover and the block and you can kind of work it out from there where you're at. This is the front cover that we did have. It's obviously rusty, it's bent, some, it's been hit and had screwdrivers jammed in it. Somebody's broken off the timing tab for us. So we've decided to get rid of that and we've gone to an aluminium cover. It's got the, the wear pad on there for, the, for that nylon cam button that we've just put in. The only downfall being a cheaper cover is it doesn't have a step for the front seal so you can push the front seal all the way through. Easiest way I find to do it is find something to sit the cover on so you don't break it. Get your front seal so that's out, that's the inside. If you, if you work on the theory that the spring is on the inside to stop the oil coming through the seal you'll be, uh, you'll be pretty spot on most of the time. So we'll just get that started a little bit. I've got my trusty hammer again. We'll just bump that. Once you get it started, if you can just keep working it around so the steel goes in as straight as possible. If you get it on a big angle, you'll bend that steel housing and it'll probably leak. That's it. Just tap it down till the front's flush. And that cover's right to go on. I'll, uh, I'll put a little bit of seal on, on the gasket because I'm sure that isn't flat. And we'll bolt her up. That's just got a really thin film of seal on, on the gasket, just enough to take up the differences should there be any high or low spots. You don't want that much seal on it, but goop's pouring out the side, it'll get into the oil pickup, it'll get inside the engine for sure, and it looks really messy. These locate on dowels, 
So you just get the cover home on the dowels, don't pull it up with the bolts, the cover will break for sure. Um, sometimes if they don't have the dowels, you can actually get them that far off centre that the front seal will leak because it's not central on the pulley. So just, just keep, an eye, keep your eyes open, I'll tighten this up, and then pistons and rods. The pistons and rods are ready to go in, but before we get too excited, we need to clean out the bores for the final time. Now this thing's been degreased a couple of times, and you probably think the bores are pretty clean, and, and they certainly look clean. But what we've been doing for years now, as part of our final clean on the bores, is wiping them out with automatic transmission fluid. It's a good assembly loop, and not just that, if you think it's clean before, put some automatic transmission fluid on a paper towel, wipe it around, and it really seems to pull any contaminants out of the, uh, out of the cast iron. So I'll go through, I'll wipe all the bores up, get them all ready, and then we'll, pit, we'll uh, do a trial fit on the rings, make sure the ring end gap is good. And that's some of the grime after wiping out the eight bores. A lot of stuff comes out and it's well worth the effort. They look clean, like I said, it's a good assembly loop so we can just push the pistons in there. We don't, we don't need to do anything else. We don't need to use engine oil or anything. But now we'll check the ring end gap and make sure that they're on point. Checking the ring end gap, it's critical, often overlooked. People think it's too hard or a waste of time. But if the ends of that ring touch in normal operating conditions, that ring will either shatter or it'll season the ball. So it's, it's quite important to, to at least know where you're at with it. I'm gonna start on cylinder one. An easy way to figure out which cylinder is cylinder one is it's furthest forward. And you can see the step in the casting. This ball is further forward than that one because the rods overlap on the crankshaft. So I'm gonna start on cylinder one. I'm gonna do top ring and second ring for each ball. I'll match them to the piston and then I can assemble the piston and ring package for each ball. So I need to put this in the ball, just gently squeeze it in. Don't want to force it, don't want to twist it, and certainly don't want it to lose its shape. Then grab a piston, push the ring down, oh, three quarters of an inch, say, and using the piston to square it up. If the ring's in there on an angle, your end gap won't be accurate. They want me to have four thou per inch end gap clearance. I've got a four inch ball, four thou, so I'm looking for about 16. If I measure that, I've probably got maybe 18 thou end gap, which is fine. That's for a moderate straight engine, it's completely acceptable. But do make the effort to read the instructions. You might learn something, and there's different ring gaps for different applications, different ring gaps for a top ring to a second ring. So I'll do them now, I'll pair them up, I'll lay them out with the piston, and then we can get ready to put these pistons in the holes. Now that I've double checked all the end gaps for my piston rings, I've got them laid out in the order of I want them per piston, we can now fit them up. So grab yourself a piston, I start from the bottom and work my way up just because it's easier. The oil ring, make sure the ends are touching, they don't overlap, they don't cross over anyway. Uh, they, these are nice enough to be painted so I can see clearly if I've got them installed correctly. I just get the end started and then kind of, kind of roll it on a little bit. So I hold my thumb on the gap to make sure that the, the oil ring doesn't come out. I grab one of the scraper rings and I stagger my gaps. The instructions are pretty clear on how you should set your gaps. So starting on the bottom, get it started and same deal kind of just screw it around and just make sure that, that the first ring you put in stays in position. Now I know where the gap is for that one. Grab your next one and stagger your gaps exactly how the manufacturer says because they've put all the homework in, they know how it should be done. And just roll that on. Make sure it's sitting in there nice. You should be able to, to move it around, it should be free, it shouldn't bind up at all. Second ring. It's got a bevel on the inside. It's also marked on the top. So the bevel on the inside on this one goes to the bottom of the engine and it's got a laser printed mark saying top. So start the end in the groove. You can use um, ring, ring expanders to get them on, but I just do them by hand. Get it started. 
and then just screw them on and try not to scratch the side of the piston. Once again, should be nice and free, you should be able to rotate it quite easily. Top ring, same deal, it's marked on the top, it's got a bevel on the inside edge and the bevel goes to the top of the engine on, on the top ring on, on this particular manufacturer. Get it started in the groove and just roll it on. You shouldn't have to force it at all, it should go together pretty nice. I'll keep going, I'll get the next lot of rings done, I'll get them all fitted up to the pistons and then we'll stick the pistons in the holes. I've got the Conrod bearing installed with assembly lube, piston ring compressors on so we're ready to go. Chevy's been nice enough to put a, a casting in the top of the piston so we know which way is forward. And for orientation on the Conrod, it's got a bigger chamfer on one side than the other. And this is to give you clearance for the fillet on the crankshaft journal. Now make sure that's square and home. Casting pointing forward, I know which way the wrist pin is. I've got the crankshaft journal all the way down so we've got as much room as we possibly can to work with. I've seen a lot of guys bump these in really slow. And often when that happens, the, the piston ring will come out below the piston ring compressor because it's bumping up and down so much. So if you can get it in in one smooth motion, you're much better off. It's one smooth motion, it should go in there, in there pretty easy. You shouldn't have to force it. There is a chamfer on the top of the board to make it a little bit easier. But if it catches up, pull it out and start again. I'll keep putting these in and we'll get this done. All the pistons are in, so we're just going to make sure the deck of the block is clean. There's no oil or assembly lube on there. So when we get time to fit the heads, there's no oil under the head gasket. And the head gasket's got every chance to seal against the block. We were obviously a bit sus on the cylinder heads with the amount of water they had sitting in the front of them when we originally pulled the engine down. But what we found was the valves were, were very badly worn, but the valve seats themselves were completely pitted, the hard facing had come off the seats and that they were ruined. So we've we've had to give the cylinder heads quite a quite a big overhaul really. We cut it out, we've put proper hardened seats in there, guides have been fixed up, valves have been cut, and a good surface grind to not only get rid of all the rust off them, but to, to get it down to the point where the damage has been cut out from the where the rust had corroded into the cylinder head itself. So we're ready to put these things back together. First thing we'll do is put the valve stem seals on. These are a, a positive valve stem seal, what they call a positive valve stem seal. What we do is there's an installation tool you can buy. Um, if not, a deep socket will do the job. Just place them on there, get them started, and just gently bump them down. Can see how far they go down. If you just hit them with a hammer, you'll damage the the uh, the rubber, the nitride, or whatever it is. That's it. So go through, put all of these on, and then we can flip the head up. We can get the valves in it, and we can put the valve springs and retainers back on the cylinder.
they're all now on, they sit home. These ones are quite firm to get on actually, which is a little bit unusual. I've got all my valves laid out. They're all numbered, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers on the end there. But that way I know which valve has been ground to which cylinder and they can go together in order. So, a little bit of assembly lube on the tip. Just to protect the initial start up, it also makes it a lot nicer to go through on the uh, on the valve stem seal as you're pushing through, less likely to tear the um, tear the rubber. And they all feel really good, and and so they should. It's almost a brand new cylinder head again. So the last exhaust valve. We'll do the uh, we'll do the intakes while we're at it. Brand new valves, obviously. A, a proper stainless valve just so they won't give us any trouble with unleaded fuel unlike the unlike the factory setup with the Vortec engine which was a bit surprising the amount of damage the um, that was done there I reckon it was just because of they're, they're not specifically designed for unleaded fuels and unleaded fuels eventually do deteriorate the seats and cause that much damage we were told this is only done a hundred thousand miles and for the cylinder heads to be to be that tortured after a relatively short distance is a, a bit sad really. That's it, all the valves are in. Trusty valve spring compressor, it's the same one we used to pull it apart. Retainer, valve spring. Retainers only go, go one way, they locate on the spring. Just sit that on there and just careful not to damage the surface of the head. And that's the whole reason I've got the bit of cardboard on the benches so I don't damage the surface of the head. We've just spent all that time and effort machining it to make it nice for the gasket to bite into. We don't want to give it a scratch or any excuse for it to leak. Same as pulling it apart. We only compress the valve spring enough to get the, the collets on. These will only go one way. They're, a, they're essentially a wedge. And that's it, first ones together. So same deal. I've got them in order. Let's keep putting them together. Make sure the uh, the collets sit in there nicely. You'll find if, if they don't sit in, normally they'll shoot out across the bench. It's not really something you can um, you can half do. And just visual check. Make sure everything's clean. There's no grime on there or dirt that we missed originally. That one's been a bit difficult. That's it. I'll keep assembling these. Then I'll put that one together and then I'm ready to go back on the engine. the last one going together now when they're together just take the time and have a bit of a look over it, a bit of a visual inspection when you're done all the collets should be sitting the same height all the valves should look seated there shouldn't be anything standing out that's out of the ordinary you know so you've gone all that hard work just have a quick look at it make sure you're happy with it and then these things can go on the engine still the heads are finished and ready to go on the engine so just double check, everything's clean, dust free, there's no oil or assembly lube on, on either of the surfaces for the head gasket. We're using a multi-layer steel head gasket, we get really good life out of them and that's the only reason we use them. They locate on the dowels, make sure everything looks right, especially the ball and the overhang of the head gasket. If you've really bored your block out a lot, you might need an oversized head gasket. If any of that head gasket hangs inside the ball, I'm guarantee, I'll guarantee you'll have troubles. But we're good, we're, we're looking, looking right. The cylinder heads are right to go on. If you can get them on in one go, you'll do less damage. So kind of line the bolt holes up as you lower it down and just sit it in the place. I'll bolt these down and that's a big piece of the puzzle done.
I've just laid out the cylinder head bolts. There's a couple of different lengths, and not just that, the majority of these go in the water. So you will need to thread seal them. If you don't, they'll leak. And I've seen plenty of small block sheds in particular that have been put together by experts and all the head studs leak as soon as it's filled up with coolant. So just organizing these now, making sure they're clean. I'll thread seal the ones that need to be thread sealed and then torque them down. The cylinder heads are on and have been torqued down. Thread sealant has been applied to all the head bolts that go into the water jackets. Really critical, very important, don't forget it. So next up, it's the rocker gear, starting with the lifters. Just a hydraulic flat tap, but nothing fancy. I've got a mountain of assembly lube here, and I'm gonna go through and coat the lifters. I'm not just gonna coat the mating surface for the camshaft, but also for the bores. Now this will help the lifters seal a bit better on initial startup, help them pump up a bit quicker, and give added protection for initial startup. These should slide in the bore really smooth. They shouldn't hang up, they shouldn't be sticky. I'll get the rest of these in, and then it's the push rods. All right, that's the last of the lifters in. They've all gone in smooth, no hang ups, no tight spots. So I'm confident with that. Next up's the push rods. And while I'm covered in assembly loop, we'll keep going. So the ball on each end, just to, just a coat of assembly loop. Same, just to protect it on initial startup. It does take a little while for oil to get to those. They're under a lot of pressure on initial startup anyway, just with the weight of the valve spring. They've got a pretty tough job to do. And if this was a high revving engine with heavy valve springs, it's even more important. So I know these are clean, but just double check them as you go. Make sure they're clean and you can see through them. And put all the push rods in place. I've dropped all the push rods in there and as they go in, just make sure they're sitting in the cup of the lifter. They can bounce out, they can sit in the corner of the lifter. And if you put some weight on that, best case it'll pop the circlip out of the lifter, worst case it'll damage the lifter and you'll forever have a tick in your engine and you won't know what it is. So just make sure they're sitting all where they should be. Next up's the rockers. Just a pressed steel rocker. Once again, nothing fancy, it's just a streeter. So just make sure there's assembly lube in the receiving cup of the push rod and also on the end that touches the valve. As this goes through its normal motion, it drags across the top of the valve. They're slightly offset, so as they come back, they'll actually turn the valve in the cylinder head so it doesn't continue to, to wear the seat the same way, it's sort of like a self-cleaning. All the rockers, let's get them on. Lifters are in, push rods are in, rockers are in. Now it's time for the retainers and the rockers. They've got a ball that sits on top of the shaft and holds the rocker in place. So the rounded shiny side goes down towards the rocker and the flat side is the side the nut locks onto. More assembly lube, same. These things will take ages to get oil up to them on initial startup. So assembly lube those, drop them on. We'll get the nut started and then it's time to set the rockers. Thank God all the pivot balls are in. I'm finally finished with the assembly lube and I can put the nuts on now. Nuts, same. Flat side down, tapered side up. The tapered side's got a stamp in it so the nuts don't come loose. Now don't tighten these things all the way down. We're gonna get them all started and then we'll go through and adjust them up. All the rocker nuts are on except for one. One's on maximum lift and with this cam on maximum lift, I can't even get the nuts started on the rocker. So I know that if this one's on maximum lift, the one next to it on the same cylinder is on the base circle. So that's gonna be the first rocker I adjust. Now hydraulic rockers, these are zero plus one, right? So that's take up all the slack in the push rod, all the slack in the lifter, you don't wanna to start to compress the lifter, but it's so you're at exactly zero lash. Now when you get close, just twist that push rod between your fingers and slowly tighten it down. And you'll feel a change when you get to zero, when it takes up all that slack and there's a little bit of drag on the push rod. That's exactly where we are, we are now. So we're at zero, plus one turn, one full turn. 
finished. That rocker is set. I'll mark that and I'll turn it till the next one comes on a full lift, wherever that may be, and set the cylinder next to it. And I'll keep going through doing them like that. In two full engine rotations, I should have all the rockers set. Looking down at cylinder one, the lifter at the front is all the way to the top of the bore. So I know that that's on maximum lift. So the one next to it is on the base circle of the camshaft. So we've got just a little bit of play there in the push rod. So we'll just take up that slack in the rocker. And then as I just twist the bush rod between my fingers and slowly tighten it down, I can feel the change in resistance as it now preloads into the lifter. Now where that is now, so that's zero. So I go one full turn down, that's zero plus one. All the rockers have been set and I've marked them all so I can visually check that I haven't missed any, that I've, I've done them all and I haven't accidentally forgot one down the back. They've all got paint on them so I know exactly where I'm at. Now, it's almost party time. We're just about ready to put some shiny things on the engine, which is cool, but before we get there, we need this thing on number one TDC compression stroke. Now I've already told you how to figure out which cylinder is number one. How to figure out it's on compression stroke, well you can stick your finger in the spark plug hole when you turn it over and you'll hear it when it's making compression. You can also watch the valve events because you can see the lifters. So you know that after the intake closes and it comes up around you're on compression. We know it's on compression when the valves are shut. How do you know you're on TDC? Well, if you've got a timing mark, you can use it. But I've got the sump off. I can look up the bottom of the engine and I can see when that journal is in the middle of the bore, that's exactly TDC. Now, why do I need that? Why do I need to know where I'm at? Because we've got to put a distributor in this engine. It just makes it easier. If we're set, ready to go, we can drop that distributor in, fire it at number one post, and we're exactly where we need to be. It's intake manifold time. I'm just sitting the gaskets on now. A little bit of sealer under the gasket and then the gasket goes on. I'll put a little bit of seal on around the water jack on the head. It's actually probably not the best mating surface in the world. It's got a little bit of corrosion on there. So just enough seal to take up any discrepancies and any pits or whatever. A slight um, bead on the front and rear of the block. Now this is only enough to take up the gap under the intake manifold. We don't want that much that's pouring out the front or pouring out the back or filling the inside of the engine. Just enough to stop the oil leaking. Particular attention to the corners. If it's going to leak anywhere, generally it's out of the corners. I'll just get this last bead on, just this last little bit. That's it. I'm happy with that. Next up to intake manifold. Try to get it on in one go, get it sitting down to where you want it. If you have to move it around or, or rock it from side to side, you might push that sealant out where you don't want it. So I can just visually line up the bolt holes, drop it down to where it needs to be, and make sure it's kind of level. You don't want it sitting all the way down on one side. The V won't be right, and it'll leak for sure. That's where I want it. I'll get the bolts in and I'll torque that down as well. Now that we've got the intake manifold on, it's time to put the distributor in. This is why we're on number one compression TDC. We know exactly where the engine rotation is. So I'll put the distributor cap on the distributor and I've got my orientation where I want it. And if I line the post up, and draw a pen mark down the side there. When I put this thing in the car, if I've got the rotor pointing towards my mark, it'll start. It's quite a large cap on this distributor and to get my cap in the orientation I want, I want my wiring towards the front of the engine. So I've got a little bit of assembly lube on the gear and because we are only lining up the cam, we don't have to line up the oil pump as well. I can just drop that in. I'll just pull it out, <clears throat> just move it a couple of teeth, have another go. It's exactly where I want it right there. The timing's close enough to get this thing to fire up first go. And the distributor orientation's right. The vacuum can's where I want it and the distributor cap will fit nice up against the firewall of the car. Put the clamp on, tighten it up, 
we shouldn't have to move that again until this thing's running. We'll get this finished off, and then we'll roll the engine over, we can put the oil pump in the bottom and the sun. Hopefully looking at the bottom of the engine for the last time. Next to go in is the oil pump. Everything else is in, the rear cradle's in with the rear main seal in it, it's on, new gasket, a bit of sealant. All the con rods are torqued up, all the main bolts are torqued up. So next in is the oil pump. The old oil pump has done 100,000 miles. Pulled the gears out just to have a look and it looks like it's been pumping sand and it looks really bad. Normally we replace them anyway, it's a really cheap component of the engine. So we've got a brand new oil pump ready to go in. I've just swapped the pickups over. Pickups are press fit, tap them out and then tap them back into the new housing. We've got the distributor in, so the oil pump drive shaft's next. It's got a little step machined in at one end and the nylon collar that comes with the new, uh, new oil pump. That just clicks on. You can put a bit of lube on that if you want and then that just drops down into the hole. The distributor end, it's already got a relief in the block to stop that, that tang from coming out where it actually locates. So that just sits down into there, you feel it drop into place. Now the new oil pump, I did pull the cover off, I have had the gears out, I put a really light layer of assembly loop over all the gears. Couple of different reasons. Yes, it's extra protection on startup, but not just that, it helps the gears seal in the housing. So it will pick up the oil quicker. So instead of waiting four or five seconds to get full oil flow and full oil pressure to the engine, it's probably half that time. So another thing that's, that's well worth the effort. So if I could just align the tangs up with the oil pump drive shaft, it sits and dowels on the main cap there and that's on. Big bolt to hold it all down. I'll bolt that down and then the next thing I'll check is the pickup height versus the sump. We want about a quarter inch gap so we have to measure it because I've had it out I want to make sure it's in the right place. Alright oil pumps torque down. I'll just be particular and make sure that both the drive shaft for the oil pump and the oil pump itself is locked into that nylon coupler. Stops those tangs coming apart, keeps a positive drive, so it's pretty important. Next up, let's measure the pickup height. To check the height of the pickup, I've just got two steel rules. So if I put one across the face of the pickup and measure from the bottom of that to the deck of the block. And if you're worried that it's a little bit uneven, come over and check the other side and then you can average your measurements versus the depth of the oil pan where the pickup's going to sit in the oil pan so I've got uh, maybe three quarters of an inch there so I'm, I just want to raise that pickup a little bit easy way to do that is I'll just get a bar in there just lift it up to where I want it and then the sump's going on sump, just a little bit of sealant on any gap or any corner you think the rubber won't sit into using a rubber one piece gasket because I like them and they don't leak. I want to seal that up, get the sump on, get the oil baffle plate on. It's probably the last thing to go on really under the, um, under the sump there. I'm going to button this thing up and then we're done. Mm -hmm.